is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I thank you, Lord, for your word, your powerful, powerful living word. I pray, Lord, that as this, this is the, the first seed that is going to be planted in 2024, Father, that it would be the seed that permeates throughout the entire year, Father, that it would be, Lord, what we are envisioning for new life, Father, that it would be exactly what it is that you want, Lord, because you're the, the pastors of this church have heard from you, Father. So, Lord, let this message not be something that I speak or something that I teach out of my own mind, but let it be a word directly from heaven into the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. amen. So we're calling it Back for More in 24. So, <laughs> you know, we try to rhyme it to make it interesting. I, I, I kicked around a bunch of different things, and um, this is the one I came back. I came up with was Back for More in 24. And um, uh, I wanted to read, uh, last week I read some of these scriptures, and I just want to start today by uh, reiterating some of this. And I started with a quote by Winston Churchill that says, the farther back you can look, the farther forward you're likely to see. And we took that last week, and we laid a foundation for what is vision and uh, a faith for vision of the future. And, and every time we talk about vision, it's always about the future. It's always about, but vision is so much more than that. Vision is about hindsight, insight, and foresight. Yeah. So we want to we wanna have it all. I want to be able to look back, right? Sometimes we say we want to leave the past behind because it was not good. I didn't do good last year. I didn't behave very well. The finances weren't good. Our, our, I won't say that. I don't speak political things. So, you know, things were just not good last year, right? Yeah. So we want to leave those things behind. But the fact of the matter is that we need to remember those things, yeah. right? Today we're going to have communion. And Jesus said, well, we uh, have this bread and this wine in what? Remembrance of me. Yeah. See, if we leave all these things behind, then we don't learn anything. Right. We just recycle Christianity and we recycle religion and we recycle whatever it is that we're into here. And we're not into religion, by the way. We are Christians, and we have a relationship, not a religion. But we don't want to recycle that and do the same thing this year. And then, you know, like I said last week, we have our New Year's resolution. How many of you made some of those? How many of you have been to the gym already? <laughs> well, you always go, Chris, so that's not even fair. I, that's not, I, just don't even look that way because he's like, you know, ripped. But uh, anyway, uh, I haven't gone yet. But, uh, and I was expecting something from the first row here, but I didn't get it. But uh, <laughs> I haven't gone to the gym yet, but there are things that we commit to do, and then by February, it's gone. And why? What do we say when, it, when we finally just leave it alone? Oh, well, we'll wait till next year. And that's what happens is we, because we get a do-over the first of every year, right? We get a do-over, we could, we could leave that behind and then start over again. I don't want to do that. I want to catapult from where we're at and continue to grow and go forward, right, and, be, and become a better husband, a better father, a better Christian, right? Come on. We want to reach our community better. We want to be able to support our min the ministries, the outreaches better. We want to do everything better. I don't want to recycle everything. So we're back for more in 24. I want more of him. I want more of his word. I want more of his power. I want more of his anointing. Come on. Don't we want more? I want more. So Proverbs 22, 28 says, do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. Yeah. And this is what happens with, uh, 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 you know, our society and our culture is that the young people grow up. And because of technology, every six months, I mean, come on, uh, what are we on, iPhone 162 or something? <laughs> right? It's just every six months, something new and something new. And there's new technology and there's new connection and the Internet's faster and 5G, 6G, 8G, 10G, we're... We're just moving fast, right? And us older ones that, you know, kind of know a little bit about the, you know, listen, you young people, you're welcome, okay? Because we started the internet. Yes, we did, Generation X. 
We started it. We would press a button and go, yeah, and we go get a cup of coffee and some bread, and then we sit down and it would connect. And then you would search something, which you could probably get quicker by going to your encyclopedia. Oh, you don't know what that is. Okay. So you can, right? They delivered the books every week or every month. They would come. I think we had some mom. If I remember, the encyclopedia, remember that? And if you had to do a report on zebras, you had to wait until the Z book came in because it was in alphabetical order. So you better hope that you didn't have to do a report on zebras because you wouldn't get the book in time. It was just every week or whatever. And you, they were expensive. And that's how you got all your information was out of these massive books that were on shelves in your home. And then the internet started and and then we, right, and we were ahead of you guys because of that. And now you guys come along and the internet has turned into, right, you can connect. I mean, right, you got your watches connecting, you're pressing stuff in your ear. You know, uh, the other day, uh, now they got the, 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 the hearing aids. They're incredible. I was talking to somebody, I won't tell you who, I was talking to somebody that had a hearing aid, one of the good ones. And then he stopped and kind of looked. And he says, it's going to rain tomorrow. And I'm like, we're having a conversation. Why would you say that? Oh, because I get the weather. His phone's connected to his ear thing, and he gets the weather every so many minutes. I'm like, that's very distracting. He said, I'm talking to you here. So that might work with your wife. You know, you turn it down. But with me, I want to have a conversation. So things have just progressed so fast. And what happens is the older people don't know a lot of this stuff. I mean, if we keep up a little bit here and there, right? And the younger people do. So then the younger people are like, these older people have no idea. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know. Listen, I got more street smarts than most people in this room. <laughs> right? I've been on the streets of Miami. I've lived. I know, right? I know how to deal with people. That's a big deal nowadays. People, you know how, how the younger group deals with people? That's why they're so brave. That's why they're so brave. They sit, right? But you got to learn from the older, from the past, right? That's why it says, which your fathers have set. There's stuff for you to learn from us. Yes. Now, can I turn that around? There's stuff for us to learn from you too. Yes. Okay? So that's why it's so important to have all the ages in the church. And I had a short conversation with uh, Pastor Dan uh, the other night because we were talking about what we're doing with the men and and there's a special ministry happening right now or, or in need of uh, these younger men in their 20s and 30s that are married with little kids. And, and uh, we want to be able to create something. That's something that we're doing in 2024. If you got the, the January calendar, you'll notice that it'll say men's group on Thursday to be determined, TBD. So in January, we're going to have one men's group starting up. And then the other one, we're not sure what we're going to do yet because we're, we're still brainstorming on uh, this younger group of men that are in need of ministry. They've come to me, and after saying that I'm intimidating and it's <laughs> difficult to talk to me, I don't understand that at all. I must have that, that look or whatever, you know, that Fidel Castro look or something. But um, <laughs> they, they come, and they, and, but they, they've shared with me some concerns and some things that they are in need of, and that's, that's awesome. I mean, that's incredible, and we want to be able to provide that for them. So that's coming in the near future here uh, at New Life. But Isaiah 58, 12 says, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. Your, your people. You will be called repairer of broken walls and restorer of streets with dwellings. Listen to this scripture in the Message Bible. Isaiah 58, 12. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew. Rebuild the foundations from out of the past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything. Restore, restoration is part of our vision, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate, make the community livable again. That's what I want. I want to be a repairer of the breach, the one that could fix anything, right? And what do we do? We have to look at what we've done what we've done right, what we've done wrong, what needs to change, what doesn't need to change. And, and listen, the older, I, I understand, because there's, there's positive and negative, there's pros and cons on, on all age groups, but the older you get, the, the less you want to change. 
I like things the way they are. I'm comfortable with the way things are. But if we don't change and we don't provide for the sheep properly and we don't make adjustments. Now, I'm not saying we're going to turn everything upside down because there are things that we're doing and things that are, are successful and things that are beneficial and of a blessing to others, and we want to continue to do that. So uh, we're not uh, looking forward until we look into our past. And the things that we have done right and the things we've done wrong, we need to move into our future by building anew with the rubble of old. Now, it uses the word rubble, so it sounds like it's destroyed, but it basically what it's saying is there are some ancient stones. There are some things, Right? Uh, uh, you know that the church is not built with walls and drywall and metal and all that. It's built with, built with what the Word says is called living stones. That's us. Right? We are The church is living. That's us. Not the building, but we are the church because God built the church with living stones. So um, back for more in 24. So as we evaluate where we were, where we are, where we're going, the history, the future... It reminds me of God's evaluation of the seven churches in the book of Revelations. We're going to the Revelations. You guys want a Revelation? I'm only covering chapter 2 and 3 today, so, and I'm going to go through it pretty quick, so I'm not going into the, the stuff that might make you nervous. But I will tell you this, because you know I don't normally uh, te teach eschatology out of Revelations or end times or tribulation and, and those kind of things. Some of those things, uh, I got some great books I can recommend to you about um, and that are good, but... There's so many, so many different teachings and so many different revelations out there and so many different, right? And you could sit down with three different uh, theologians and get three different answers to what something means. But the Bible is very, very clear. If you read everything in context, you will see that, uh, that the answer is always there. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, God does through uh, John the Apostle when Jesus visits, visits him is, um, is give him the... The, the valuation of these seven churches. Now, you guys know that I've taught this before out of the uh, Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, where you have left your first love, right? So, but there's six other churches that he speaks of, and we want to cover those uh, fairly quickly. So the way I'm going to do this today is I'm going to cover um, the, uh, the good part, right, where he commends them and tells them how good they're doing. And then there's a, a critical part and a part where he reprimands the church or tells the church what's being done wrong. Now, this is back to back. So it's all the way through uh, verse, uh, chapters 2 and 3 in Revelation. But the epistles, that's exactly what it is. So if you read through Romans, you'll see everything they've done good. And then you'll see Paul write, right? The, the one church that he writes to is, is uh, that he doesn't uh, reprimand, which is my favorite chapter. I don't like, how many of you like to be spanked? I don't like to be spanked. So uh, Philippians, Philippians, he's always commending them and telling them, thank you for giving to my ministry and for teaching me. And, and there's all these encouraging words in there, how not to be anxious, how to be in peace. And uh, he shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's all chapter four. So you can go through the, the book of Philippians and it's, it's pretty much a feel good book. But, uh, and you'll see here that he, he covers uh, uh, the, the, the church in uh, Philadelphia, just for you guys. I'm going to cover that in just a minute. So anyway, so let's look, right? So number one is the church in Ephesus. And we've heard this before, right? Um, I, before I get into this, I want to say, uh, if, if any of these things look familiar, or I don't want to ever sound like I'm being critical of the church next door, or the church down the street, or, you know... Uh, a lot of the churches, especially churches our size, uh, we have we have a an opinion. That's a good word. An opinion for the mega churches, and we have an opinion for some other teachers in the way that they teach. In the way we should have no opinion about those things. God has called those people to do the work of the ministry. What does what good is if we were all the hand? And what we do is when we say the church is the body of Christ. We, co we consider that amongst ourselves. One's the hand, one's the foot. But that's not what it means. It means the body means all the churches together. Yes. So some churches have the ministry of the foot, and some of them have the ministry of the ear, and some of them have the ministry of the, right? So why, one, don't, what, what good would it be? So quit trying to be somebody else. And what he's saying there is let everyone do what I've called them to do. And it is not up to us to determine whether what they're doing is a calling of God or not. Right. So... Uh, please do not take any of this that I'm saying. I'm going to read it right out of here. I'm going to say a couple of things, and then we're going to go through the seven churches. 
And as I do this, I'm gonna, at the end, I'm going to give you the seven uh, benefits or blessings of uh, obeying these things and changing these things in the church. So Revelations chapter 2. <laughs> chapter 2, verses 2 through 6. Every time you say Revelation, everybody gets nervous. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. So far, so good. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Ah, why don't we just stop there? Nevertheless, I have this against you. Now, this is Jesus speaking through John to the church in Ephesus, which is the church that is most like the the. the you know, common church of today. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. That puts it on the church, right? That's our fault. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent. Turn around. Repent's not a bad word. It's not a root canal, right? It's not painful. It's just change your mind. Change your direction, right? Repent and do the first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. I'll go back to that in just a minute. But this you have that you hate, or the word is really detest, the deeds of the, I'm going to say it my way, and then I'm going to say it the right way, Nicolaitans, which I also detest. So that word is Nicolaites. Uh, I guess that N is is, uh, 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 silent, but Nicolaites is how you say it. But when he's saying here, you have left your first love, you have fallen, repent. I will come quickly and remove the lampstand. Let's talk about the lampstand. So if you start reading in the book of Revelation, it says that there are the seven lampstands. How many of you know, right? Those lampstands are are very simply the church because he's talking about the seven churches. So what is a lampstand? And these are not just any lampstand. These are golden lampstand. And what do you do with a lampstand? You put candles in it, right? And you light it up and it brings light, right? So the church's responsibility is to bring light, right? Light to the word, light to the world, light to to the community. It's to bring light. It's to pierce the darkness, right? To to come against those things that are of the dark things. So they're light. And then the fact that it's made out of gold, in those times, gold is not like today where they put some impurities in, you know, because uh, they kind of mix it so that it's a, they make a little bit more out of it. But uh, uh, gold is purified through Fire. You guys are awesome. You could probably come up here and teach this. uh, Gold is purified by fire, right? And the church has been through since the beginning, since Acts chapter 1. It's been through quite a bit. They stoned Stephen. They went after Paul. They stoned Paul and and thought he was dead, right? I mean, all the stuff that's happened to the church and still happening today. We live in the United States. We don't see half of what's happening, right? right? We're not in Israel. We're not Jews for Jesus that are currently proclaiming the, the, the gospel on Gaza Strip as a Jew. They're risking their lives to be there and to, and to preach the gospel to people, right? So we're, we're not part of that. We live in a free country. We get to gather, proclaim Jesus as our Lord, our Savior, our King, and nobody comes through the door and stops us and takes us to jail. There are countries out there that if you're caught with a Bible, the first time it's 13 lashings uh, in the middle of the of the main street, so everybody can see you. If you're caught again, they kill you, cut you into pieces, and drop you in the streets. We we have no idea. That's a Bible. I collect them. I have shelves and shelves of Bible in there. Bibles, all different kinds, all different religions, all different. I have them in there because I, I I love collecting old Bible. I think my oldest one is like eighteen something. Um, and, and I, every once in a while, I take it out because the, the pictures in there that they painted and stuff, it's just amazing. But uh, as we read through this, we got to understand that what he's saying is you've left your first love, right? So we have the lampstand, which is the church. So we're here to bring the light. We're here to be pure. And he says, you have left your first uh, love or your first works. Go back to your first works. Now, if you're saved and you gave your life to the Lord, I know uh, Uh, June 21st, 1987, I gave my life to the Lord. I prayed a prayer. I asked God to come into my life. It changed me completely. Now, I'm still who I was, but I'm just not doing the things that I was doing before. Not because I have to, not because of a list of do's and don'ts, but because all I want to do is please my Lord, my Savior, my King. 
because he died for me and he, he changed me that day. And because of that, I have become who, and, and I'm still got a lot to go, right? So on that first month or two months or a year, maybe the first three years, man, I, I had a Bible under my arm. I, I cut my, my hair and, and uh, you know, I did a lot of, a lot of things and, and went to church every Sunday. Every time the doors were open, I was sitting in church. I was on fire. I went back to all my old friends that I used to sit around in a circle with, and uh, there was a lot of smoke without a fire. You know what I'm talking about? So, um, so you know, I was hanging. So I went back to them. with. In fact, it was this actual Bible. This Bible's 30, 1987, so whatever that is, uh, 34, 35 years old. No, 37, 37 years old. So I went back with my Bible under my arm, and they laughed at me. I went back to tell them, I found, you guys are doing, we're doing all these things, and we're, we're, do, you know, we're trying to find something. I found it. It's Jesus. They didn't want anything to do with me. I didn't know the Bible. I didn't, all I knew is that something happened to me. But I was on fire. I didn't care. I said, you don't want it? I'm out of here. And I was gone. I lost all my friends. I lost everybody. But I gained a new family in the church, and I continued everywhere I went. I was constantly trying to tell people about Jesus and co- constantly trying to tell people, you need to know what happened to me. This happened to me. My testimony, right? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That's in Revelations, by the way, right? So I, I was on fire for the Lord. Well, you know, as you start to grow and you learn and you learn about the Bible and you become smart, right? You become, you go to Bible school and, and you know, you start walking around with a little bit of a strut because you know more than anybody else. And, and before you know it, you've left the first love. And what was that? The fact that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. See, Jesus taught his disciples, sent them out. They did miracles, cast out demons. They came back and started telling Jesus, look what happened. We cast out demons, and we did miracles. And he goes, don't celebrate that. Celebrate the fact that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I believe that what he was saying that day is, You need to stay in your first love to be able to do all these other things. You need to stick to what actually happened. That's why we have communion. Remember what Jesus did. I remember every time I come to, every time we have the little bread and the little cup of juice, right? Every time we do that, I remember who I was. I remember everything that Jesus uh, uh, delivered me from. I remember, I remember, I remember. So when he's telling the church here uh, uh, about the first love, Right? And then he tells them, you despise, you, I'm so glad that you don't like that, you hate the deeds. The Nicolates, the Nicolaitans, were a sexually immoral people with their own doctrine. Their actual name consists of two words, to conquer and people. Nico, Latais, conquer, people. They were out to conquer the people living righteous lives and bring them back into their doctrine or their way of life. See, the the church in Ephesus, they hated, detested as we should. Now, this is not, it was hating their deeds, the things that they were doing, right? It hated their deeds, not the people. Not the people. And this same people, the, I'm going to say it the way that, that I, I, I listen. I have this little thing where you hit the button and it tells you how to say it in, in their language, uh, Nicolates. And the word Nico is where we get the word Nike, which means to conquer. So if you're wearing them today, that's where they got the word from, from the Bible, right? Oh, I'm wearing Christian shoes. No. <laughs> this Nike, this conquer was completely different than the one that we think of. But that's where it comes from, from the word Nico. Number two. So now the church in in Smyrna, not New Smyrna here, but in in Smyrna, these were warnings of things to come. Now this one, there's no real rebuke. So he doesn't like point out a bunch of stuff they're doing wrong, and he doesn't, but he he does warn them of things to come. So it's worth reading in Revelation 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation for 10 days. 
even tells him how long. I think that's kind of good, so you know when it's going to end, right? Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. See, we think that, you know, I've said this before, Christianity, we tell people, oh, you know, become a Christian, give your life to the Lord, start going to church, and all your problems go away. Your mortgage gets paid, your wife submits to you, your children start doing what they're supposed to be doing. Everything works out. They give you a raise at work, right? All your diseases go away, all your men, right? There is promises for all these things, by the way. But just because it happened there doesn't mean that it happens here. It requires faith, right? It requires our faith to be able to uh, bring these things into fruition, into our uh, realm into the natural realm from the spiritual realm because we believe that these things have already been paid for by his stripes we are already healed right so these things are there for us but what we forget is that sometimes becoming a christian means that you're going to go through some stuff and you're like wait a minute i'm already going through stuff why would i become a christian to go through more stuff because you're going through your stuff be- alone and this stuff is going to affect you for the rest of your life in fact it could destroy you Because the stuff is coming right from the enemy, and the enemy is here to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. But see, if I'm in this side, and I got God on my side, right, and I'm going to make it through these opportunities, because that's what they are, opportunities to grow, then, so he's he's warning them. There's no real rebuke. He just warns them. And when we get to the end, you're going to see, if they overcome this, what their uh, blessing is going to be. Number three, the church in Pergamos. So they were harboring false teachers. And this church, uh, we have locally here an area that would kind of fit what this church is and what it does, and that's the area of Casadega. If you're not familiar with Casadega, it's a very spiritual area. And, uh, you know, they have all these spiritists there and and palm readers and tarot cards and, uh, you know, all these different things. And There is a church, the only Christian church, and they say that they are in the doors or the gates of, they have set up in the gates of hell, (laughs) right? And that's the Deutimus church. Uh, A friend of mine uh, started that, John Farrell, and uh, he's actually been here a couple of times, but um, he started that church, and now there's a pastor there from Africa, which is perfect because they know how to deal with the spiritual stuff, right? And uh, Pastor George, and he's pastoring that church now. If you ever head into... uh, um, Casadega off of uh, Martin Luther King, I believe it's what it's called there in in, uh, uh, in Deland, and you make that left or right, depending where you're coming from, and you head in on the left-hand side, you'll see the church there. It's, it's called the uh, Deutimus Church. So Revelations, this is the church in Pergamos. Revelations chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you. Isn't it awesome to be Christian? Where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. Oh, boy. Because you have there, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. That's a pretty serious accusation. Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the, here they are again, Nicolaites, 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 which, things, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You'll get that when I get to the end to read this. But uh, these are uh, uh, false teachers. This is where the enemy comes to rob us of the truth. There's truth and there's lies. You're either under the father of truth or you're under the father of lies. There's no gray area. There's no in between. There's no middle area, right? And these were were liars. In one case, they actually had a a, a statue. uh, uh, They call it the throne. They had a statue of a serpent. A massive, and they would bow before this. And, and uh, as you know, there, there were other statues uh, there in, in Balak and Balaam that they would bow before. And that's why they called it, right, Satan's throne. Pergamos was the center of idolatry, and there was a giant serpent as one of their idols. That's why they called it Satan's throne. Number four, the church of Thyatira. 
Now, this was allowing a wicked prophetess, Jezebel, to influence the people. This still happens today. Revelations chapter 2, 19 through 20. I know your works, love, service, faith, patience, and as your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things, a few, a few things against you. Because you allow the woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and things sacrificed to idols. Because we always connect Jezebel to sexual immorality, which we should. That's the type of spirit that this is. But uh, this, this selfish is all about self-gratification. It's all about self, I, you know, uh, uh, if they offered a, a lechon, a, a, you know, a, a Cuban pig marinated in mojo to an idol, it would be very difficult for a lot of us Cubans and Puerto Ricans not to have a bite of that, right? Because it's gratifying. It's something that tastes good. It's something that, right, that we're used to, that we grew up eating. So we, we go back to it. So that's what the enemy does here. And this spirit, although... Do you guys know what happened to Jezebel? I can't get into all that, but uh, she fell out of a window into the street, and dogs came and ate her. And uh, yeah, so they, they did that, and I believe there's some theologians that believe this. This is not necessarily right in there that you can read it, but um, they did that so that there would not be a burial place for her so that people couldn't go back and continue to worship her remains. So her remains were eaten by dogs so that no, there was nothing left of her and there was nothing left behind. But that spirit is still in the church. So quiet. It says, it says, we've allowed this to happen. And that's, that's not my fault. I mean, I take responsibility for my part. But we've allowed this to happen. And that's why I think there's such a ministry for these young men. It, it, it's not just the young men, because nowadays it attacks everyone. And we know that our, our society and our community is showing that. But our young man is struggling with some of these things because of the spirit that we've allowed. She called herself a prophetess. She said, hey, I have word from God for you. Do what feels good. Do what feels right. If it makes you feel good, it's got to be from God because God is good. Just do it. That's a lie from the pit of hell, right? But it says, hey, you got to do something about this. Number five, the church in Sardis. Look good on the outside, but spiritually dead on the inside. It says, made a name for itself. And this is where I don't want you to think of any other churches. I don't want you to think of, be critical of anybody else. Because I know when I read it, I had to like really fight some of those thoughts off. Revelations chapter three. Uh, I put one B because I started in the second half of uh, verse one through verse four. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive. You have a name, that you are alive, but you're dead. He doesn't even start with a good one here. He just hits him right at the beginning. Left hook, pa! That's it. I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to say anything nice about you. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. See what I mean about leaving things of old? No, take the things that remain and strengthen them. For they are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, that you have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. A few. A few. I don't want it to be a few. I want it to be all that have proclaimed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I don't want a few. And we've done that. We've, we've created a look. We've created a, you know, it looks good on the outside. I have a, a teaching on this. Uh, it's about uh, Mephibosheth and, and, and uh, David. Mephibosheth was uh, Jonathan's son, Saul's grandson. So David had made a covenant with Jonathan, Saul's son, and they both died. 
and then there was one left. But when they both died in battle, the nurse picked up Mephibosheth and dropped him, and he broke both his legs. So they sent him to this place called Lodabar, and Lodabar means a rocky place, a place where you can't plant, where you can't grow, and it was kind of like a, like a rehab, like a place where you go, and there's no work to do, there's nothing. They send people that are uh, disabled and not able to, to work the ground or do anything, they send them to this place. It's a fruitless place, right, Lodabar, and he sent them there. But when David became king, he said, listen, I made a covenant with Jonathan, and I know he's gone, but is there anyone left? And they said, there is, Mephibosheth. So they went and got him out of Lodabar. They brought him to the kingdom. They gave him all the servants that his father had before him. They gave him fields. They gave him, I mean, he went from nothing to everything. He was sitting at the king's table, it says, and he was lame in both feet. So from here up, he looked good. He's eating the bread of the king. He's drinking the wine of the king. Right, everything's good. He's probably eating pork. (laughs) Back then, maybe not, but right? He's eating, and everything looks awesome. But then that whole chapter, that whole thing ends with, and he was still lame in both feet. There's a message there that we have those that look great from here up. They're sitting at the king's table. They can talk the king's language. They know how to properly act. They know how to put their pinky up when they drink their their tea. They know how to uh, properly talk. They have a, a Christianese about them, right? They have a way that they speak, and that they have to be a Christian. Well, look under the table. That's what we need to do. We need to look under the table and see if we're lame, if we're able to walk. Why? Because to walk out your faith, you got to be able to walk, right? To be able to stand on the word, you got to be able to stand. I don't want to be lame. So we have to look under the table. We have to see. And he's telling these people here in Revelations, look, you guys look good. You look just like a Christian should look. But are you really? There's only a few of you, only a few of you that are not spiritually dead. I know this is all very negative and it sounds, and I'm not one of the, I'm, a, I'm an encouraging, you know, uh, uh, type of preacher, but we're going to get there because we want more. Yes. We want more in 24, right? Yes. Yes. We're almost there. Six, the church in Philadelphia. Here we go. No rebuke. But he does tell them that they're tired and they're weak. Revelations chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. No one can shut it, for you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Even when they were tired, they kept the word. Nine, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, remember, just a few verses back, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. That's what we want. We want people to know that you have loved us so that they can be loved also. Because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. That testing of gold, remember? Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. They were tired, they were weak, but they kept the faith. This is an example to us. Number seven, the church, in the way it's written in English is Laodosians, but it's actually pronounced Ladikus. Ladikus, yeah, that's how it's Ladikus. And uh, they were a church of spiritual lukewarmness. Revelations chapter 3, verses 15 through 19. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich. I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. This is the American church right here. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Tell us what you really think, Jesus. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire, that you may be rich, and white garments refined in fire. Remember, we spoke about that earlier. That you may be clothed, 
that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And if you know about these things in Hebrews 12, it says, he, he says that I, I love you. I rebuke and chasten those who which I love. And if you're not rebuked and not chastened, then you are not loved. For which father, how much more does our heavenly father love us, right? That whole, you can read it on your own, Hebrews 12, right? And he, here he is saying it again. And he tells them, listen, you guys are just going through the motions here. And then you accredit your Christianity to your wealth. Now, don't get mad at me if you have this on your car or whatever, but sometimes you see these big, nice Cadillacs, and you see these Mercedes-Benz, and they put the tag on it that says, blessed. Well, how about the guy that doesn't believe in God, that's an atheist, but has put some practical things into place, has either studied or opened a business and makes a lot of money and decides to buy a Mercedes and parks it right next to yours, maybe even nicer than the one you have? How am I going to differentiate the Christian from the atheist? They both drive a Mercedes, a nice one too, right? And we, we have done that. The whole message of prosperity, I don't know how many years ago, and it's still sticking around because it's a message everyone wants to hear. Who doesn't want more? I want to be poor and starving. No, who wants that? I don't want that, right? Blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit. Right? And that's not about being poor naturally. That's about having that mentality of, I have all these things, but they don't own me. I own them. Right. See, the whole thing about the, man, I'm running out of time. The whole thing about the, the, the rich young ruler when he comes to Jesus says, what do I need to inherit the kingdom? What does he say to him, right? He says, you have to, right? He tells him all the things. He goes, I do all those things. He was a tither. I do all those things. And he goes, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. He didn't say, give it to me, give it to the church. He had no interest in that, in that guy's money. Right. Jesus didn't want any, not a penny of it, and he didn't want the church to have a penny of it. Right. He said, just sell it and give it to the poor. What did he want? He wanted his heart. Right. And what did the guy say? You don't know how much I have. That's, I can't do that. Right? And it says, how much I have. And if you study that, I have a teaching on this too. If you study that out, it's, that word have means to be married to means to have a covenant with your money. It says, you're not supposed to do that. See, your money is not supposed to own you, and you make a covenant. Mammon, she cannot serve God in mammon. Now listen, we are not a poverty, lowly, we, you know, kind of church. We, we believe in prosperity. We believe in the blessings of God in our lives, and we give him credit. I give him credit for everything that I have. I'm so blessed, right? Come on. We're, the poorest per person in the United States is richer than 85% of the rest of the world. These homeless people that are out here getting two or three meals a day, I used to do that for a, for a ministry, for a living. Give them meals and give them showers, and, right? and every once in a while they get a little bit of money and they go to a hotel. And, right? Those are things that other parts of the world don't even have. So having money and having things is not, right? it's not a, a, a blessing from God. And you don't, you, I don't use that to tell people, well, look, you know, if you, that's another part, right? If you become a Christian and you start going to church and, you know, you join the church, you're going to, money is going to come out of heaven. Listen, he doesn't have a printing press up there. He doesn't t deal with paper money. I'll even, I'll prove it to you even more. He won't deal with money that has another man's face on it because he doesn't get the glory. They do. Right? You start saying things like Grant. Oh, it's a 50. Right? George Washington. If he only knew what they were doing with the $1 bill. <laughs> Some of you took a minute, right? You got it, right? I, I know. I get, we got a police officer. He understood what I meant. He understood. If they only knew what George Washington, if he only knew what he, they were doing with his face and what, you know, with the dollar bill. Right? We'll tell, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. <laughs> My wife's like, what? I'll, I'll tell you later, babe. I'll tell you at home later. See, having riches is not a sign of Christianity. For it is better to give 
than to receive. It's not about having it. It's about having it and knowing where to give it. Yeah. I want to be a conduit of his blessings, yeah. right? Yeah. Not a bank or a storehouse. Remember the storehouse guy? I got to keep going. All right, so that was, um, did I do? Yeah, spiritual lukewarmness, right? They were spiritually lukewarm because they took the natural and turned it into something spiritual when it wasn't spiritual at all. So more in 2024. That was my introduction. More, no, I'm only kidding. More in 2024, right? There were promises if they would overcome these things. So even though Jesus was pointing out these things and, crit- and giving them props about other things they were doing right, right? He was encouraging them, but he was also encouraging them to overcome. Why? Because in the end of each evaluation in the seven churches, there was a promise to overcome. So the church in Ephesus, they left their first love. Promise to overcome, Revelations 2.7. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That's the tree I want to eat from, right? That's the tree of forgiveness. That's the tree of repentance. That's the tree where everything, right? That's why he had to kick them out of the, because they had eaten from the wrong tree. And they say, if they eat from that tree, they're going to get eternal life and they're going to eternally sinful because they were already sinful. That's the tree of eternity. That's the tree where, right, Jesus represents that tree. He says, if you overcome, if you overcome, go back to your first love. Remember as you take communion that I'm, I've been saved, and he paid the entire price. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to become better. I didn't have to quit doing the things I was doing. I didn't, he loved me just like I was. Jesus paid the price so that we wouldn't have to. It's not about your works. Why do we do the things we do? Because he loved me. And I want to love him back. I don't do things that I, I don't live the way I live because I'm obligated to. That's religion. You know what the word religion means? To bind. I don't want to be bound by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I want to be free in the tree of life. Number two, the church in Smyrna, warning of things to come. No real rebuke, right? But there's still a promise. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And he says, before that, it says that he will give you the crown of life, eternal life once again. I want these things. Don't you? I want more. I want more. I want more. The church in Pergamos, harboring false teachers, the promise. Revelations chapter 2, second half of verse uh, 17. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. Woo! You have no idea. To eat. And I will give him a white stone. Thank you, Jesus. And on that stone, a new name. Written which no one knows except him who receives it. He will renew us in secret if we do the right things in public. I want to be an overcomer. I don't know about you, but I want manna. (laughs) Right? I want manna from heaven. There's some Jewish theologians that say, you know, the word manna means what is this? That's basically what it means. Right? So they were eating it going, what is this? You know why they couldn't figure out what it was? There's theologians that say that when they ate it, that it tasted like their favorite food, like whatever it is that they enjoy. So every day, like, oh, I want scrambled eggs, right? And I guess back then it'd be turkey bacon. Terrible. It's like a a meat fruit roll-up or something. It's, It's gross. Sorry, I know some of you are anti pork, but it's the best thing God ever created. <laughs> right? I I may have thought twice about my salvation if they told me they were gonna take bacon away. No. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. <laughs> right? So who overcomes, right? The overcomer, where was I? Crown of life will not receive Pergamos. Okay, that's where I was. Renewed in secret. He'll put your new name on a rock and give it to you. He's gonna make you a new you know what a new name a name in the Bible meant everything. No, that's why Jacob became Israel, right? Because he wrestled with God and survived, right? He changed his name. He's going to change your name, and he's going to keep it in secret because of the things you do in public. That's what I want. I want to be an overcomer. I want more of him, right? The church in Thyatira, allowing a wicked prophetess. Oh, I want to know what this is, right? Jezebel to influence people. The promise to overcome in Revelations chapter 2, verse 26. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end... To him, I will give power over 
the nations. Listen, the church is supposed to be in charge. You know how far we've been put off to the side? In the Old, in the Old Testament, the church and the, the, the rabbis and the priests, they would counsel the kings. Whenever the king would have a dream or something would happen, what would they call it? They'd call in a prophet and tell us what to do. Tell us what we need to do. And they would get, take, now the church, what do we know? Why? Because we've been self-gratifying ourselves. That's what it's talking about, Jezebel, right? Five. I want more of God in 24. More, more, more. The church in Sardis looks good on the outside, but spiritually dead on the inside. Made a name for itself, right? Remember that? Revelations chapter 3, verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed with white garments and will not blot out the name of, from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. You guys have heard me say this many times, that when God wants to see you, right? He says, uh, uh, I want to see Vito. And Jesus stands there and says, here I am. Because Jesus is pure and holy, and he represents us. Right? So when he asks to see one of us, who represents us? Jesus does. As holy and pure. God doesn't see us any other way. You can prove it by the way he talks about the Old Testament kings that they did, made all those mistakes and doesn't mention one of them in the New Testament. Through the, the uh, Hebrews 11, when he talks about these men of faith, all the things that they did and how faithful they were and how strong they were. And we all know that all that is not true. There's something missing. Why? God can't see that. He's holy. And he sees us that way if we overcome until the end. Right? And he keeps your name in the book of life. That's what I want. That's my promise, right? The church in Philadelphia, little strength, tired, no real rebuke. Revelation chapter 3, if you overcome, uh, uh, verse 12, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name, here we go again, of my God, in the name of the city of my God, in the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Those who represent the kingdom through the trials and tribulations. Although I'm tired, Lord, and I'm weak, you give me strength to continue forward that I may be an overcomer, that you would write your name on me. Now, the only way that we the, the natural way that we could kind of understand this, because this is so spiritual and this is so out there, is, you know, you get married and you ever seen these guys that get a tattoo of their girlfriend's name on their, on their neck or whatever, and then they go and they, and they you know, and, and if you get Lisa, then you can only date Lisas the rest of your life because you're probably not still with the same Lisa that you started off with, but, right? But when he marks us, and this is not a tattoo, I know you guys are all, what's a tattoo? It says that Jesus was marked on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, right? So I'm not, that's not condoning or saying that it's good or bad. I'm not, we don't have that opinion here for that. Uh, there's no biblical backing for that except in the Old Testament. And if you're going to follow that, then you better quit cutting your hair. You better quit eating meat. You better, because there's a whole slew of things yeah. that go along with that, right? So uh, if you're going to do it, do it all. That's what Jesus said. If you're going to do the commandments, do them all. But that name written on you, it means he's, it's his approval. If I overcome, he'll approve. If I make it to the other side, if I make it through it, if I'm strong enough, and if I, then he'll, he'll, oh man. You know what it is to get the creator of heaven and earth to approve of you? That's like, I want more. I want more of that. I want more of that. A new name for the church in Philadelphia. The church in Laodosians, spiritual lukewarmness. This is the last one. Promise to overcome. Revelations chapter 3, verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, seated in Christ at the right hand of the Father. Come on. That's what I want more of that. We want more, right? I want more. Give me more. What do you got to do? We got to overcome. 
We got to overcome. Spiritually, we have to overcome. Naturally, you have to overcome some things. I don't want to recycle 2023 into 2024. I want to move forward. I want to begin to overcome some of these things that these blessings will begin to operate in my life because I want more. I want more. I understand that scripture. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? It's like flung. You get that little sliver because it's got like 3,000 calories, right? And you eat that little sliver because you want to be good. And then you what? You go back for another sliver. Why? Because I tasted and it is good. Right? I tasted and it is good. I taste. God is good. Forget, forget flung. Forget God is good. I tasted and God. I want more. I want more. Come on, say it together. I want more. That's what we want. We got to be overcomers. Yes. And he strengthened us to do it. He didn't just say, you do it and then let. No, he lives. In the, the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead lives inside of us and it quickens our mortal body. The power of God lives inside of us. He empowered us and strengthened us to be more than an overcomer. Yes. That's what it says. More. Not just, I want to be more. Why? Because there's people out there that need Jesus, and we need to quit representing Jesus with our cars and our homes and our right and the things that we have, but by our lifestyle. Yes. Because yes. he loved the whole world. You know, when I'm out there in the streets and I talk to everybody, Ricky will tell you, I talk to, he does too, talk to everybody, right? I'll talk to everybody. Anybody that'll, if they make eye contact, I'm talking to them. That's it. I just talk to everybody. You know why? Because I see them as valuable. Yes. No matter if they're homeless, if they stink, if they're, it doesn't matter. If they have money or they don't have money, if they're, it, it, to me it doesn't matter. You know why? Because Jesus, God sent Jesus on the cross to die. And he died. And that same price that he paid for me, he paid for everyone. Yes. So in God's eyes, the value of people is exactly the same. Yes. It's the same. So why am I going to go around and say, hey, I'm a Christian. That's why I drive this. And I'm a Christian. That's why I look this way. I'm a Christian. That's why, you know, I go to church every Sunday. And, you know, you need to too. And, and we judge and we point and we tell them that we need to do this and do that and don't do this and do the other. Right? And we tell them, oh, that lifestyle you're living in. Quit attacking the lifestyle and start loving the person. Yeah. That's what we need to do. Yes. I want more. I want more unsaved people. I want to see more people be delivered from lifestyles. We don't attack the lifestyle. You love the person. That's what Jesus did. Jesus is the only one that never committed sin, yet he walked with everyone. And never once did he say, every once in a while he would say, go and sin no more. But he never pointed out their sin. What do you need? I'm a blind man. Well, here, you can see. What do you need? Never once did he blame, right? The disciples wanted to. Been blind from birth. His, his parents must have been sinners. No. Jesus says, no, 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 no. He was blind from birth from this moment right here. Because yes. he's about to see. Yes. And it doesn't matter what he's done, what he hasn't done, if he is, if he isn't, if he believes, if he doesn't yes. believe. I'm going to, because he said that that's what he wants. He wants to yes. receive. Amen? Amen. 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 So a little bit of more in 24, and then we're going to have communion. The elders can uh, make their way up and start to prepare the tables. <clears throat> so as I heard from the Lord about this, and I was really pressing in and trying to figure out what, uh, I began to do a, a little bit of a history of all the uh, uh, messages that I've preached in the first Sunday of every year. And we always start to, you know, 2020 was 2020 vision, right? And we, we tried to, 2023 was the year of the re- I went like three or four, like a month or a month and a half teaching on the different re's, repent, recover, re, you know, uh, all the different re's, and uh, I did a whole teaching on that, and then we had different ones, go deep, I think that was like 2018 or 19, so what we're going to do is I'm going to refresh those messages, and we're going to preach them back to back, and I've had the opportunity over the last couple of weeks to be able to sit down and go through these and restudy them and re- Go through, re, re, right? Go through some of these uh, scriptures and, and really understand what the Lord has been saying. He's been speaking to us since 2017. 
This year will be seven years, right? Eight years that Margie and I have been here as the pastors, but seven years that he's been speaking to us about our future. And we get all excited at the beginning of the year, and then we forget. That's why we have this to remember, yeah. right? Yeah. We forget. So we're going to reestablish that foundation, and you're going to see what the Lord has called us to. And we're going to be so encouraged over the next month, month and a half, that, that we're going we're gonna to want to burst out of these walls, right? We're going to understand what God has really called us to do and what he's been speaking into our lives because we want to repeat and reiterate the things that he has said to us. Is that okay? Amen. That's, what, that's, what I believe God, that's what I believe God has spoken to me. Amen? Amen. Amen. So um, we're going to go ahead. It's going to be a little thing back here. There'll be some music on the background. Uh, those of you on this side of the church can c come right on up here. Those of you on this side, can you turn it down a little bit? Uh, uh, can come right up. It's okay. Uh, come right up here. But before we come to the table, there's only one thing. There's a prerequisite before coming to uh, drink the body and uh, 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 the uh, drink the blood and eat the body, as the it says. Can you imagine being there that day? We know, we know what, because we know the Bible, right? So we know what was coming next. But the first time that Jesus tells his disciples, you must eat my body and drink my blood, at that point, he had over 300 followers. He ended up with 12. Because they didn't know what he was talking about. We know because we've read through, right? We, we know the beginning. We know already. We read the end, <laughs> right? But they didn't know. And imagine those 12 sitting at the Last Supper. And Jesus goes, this is my body. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> This is my blood. Oh, man, I'm so glad. I hope it's good wine. Right? I'm glad I stuck around. I'm glad I stuck around. I'm glad I overcame and listened to my king, my savior, the one who loves me more than anybody else because he gave his life for me. So if you're here today and you haven't done that, you haven't surrendered your life to the Lord, just wave at me. We'll pray with you right before communion to get all things right, and then we'll good. Leo? Leo, you, you've gotten saved like three times, but we'll do it again. Leo's so excited. He just, uh, he responds. He responds, and that's good. So amen? Amen. All right, all the kids are in here. When Mike drops himself to the ground, it's a mic drop. That was his joke. It was really bad, but, you know. Drop Mike to the ground. Mic drop. No. So go ahead and, and play that behind me, and you guys can make your way up. Our elders will serve you, and, uh, and then we'll partake together. Please hang on to your, uh, we your juice hungry, and your bread. And we will take thirsty. With nothing left to give. Please monitor the oh, children the with the little we cups. We're in. We we changed to the uh, to the white grape juice. And just Coming when in, all so. hope seemed lost, love opened the door for us. He said, "Come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been."
to the doubter, to the hero and the coward, to the prisoner and the soldier.